partiality and discrimination in the family of God. That never happens here. But honestly, I can say that, you know, as I get into this and I look and see as a church, I don't see that. Praise God. I mean, I know it exists. And it exists in our daily lives. I mean, that's just how, you know, we are. Um, You know, we look at somebody and we judge. But I think when it comes to this place, you know, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but I don't see it as a problem just by some of the examples that I can cite. But it's still something that we all got to work on, definitely, in our daily life. Um, so my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Um, you know, you remember in, uh, it's, it's just human nature. You know, in school, you had the cool kids, and you had the kids that weren't so cool. You always wanted to be with the cool kids. Uh, you know, you, I remember Pastor David talking about the guys coming in with the earrings on, and that pastor judging them. Um, we judge people, uh, you know, it's easy to do. Got tattoos, you know, all over me, and, and make an assumption about that person. Um, and here we see, you know, in James 2, here in a second, we're going to see that about, uh, you know, someone um, that's rich. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you got that song, short people got, you know, I, I was, as I was going through this, um, it talked about height and the discrimination of somebody with height. And most of your uh, um, uh, 500 companies have tall or, you know, somebody about six foot tall or tall or CEOs. And uh, it says for every inch in height, the person gains $789 a year. So if you're six inches taller than somebody, you get five more grand a year. That's a shame for Pastor Jim. Isn't it? Making five more grand than all you dudes, man. <laughs> uh, we associate leadership ability with height, but that, that's not true. You know, we go to, uh, let's go to Samuel uh, 16, 1 Samuel 16, uh, verse 6 and 7. If somebody wants to bust that out for me real quick, we'll see uh, what God says to Samuel when he was, this is when he was choosing a king. Uh, yes, sir. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 6, 16, 6 and 7. 16, 6 and 7. Now that's what we're supposed to do is look at the heart. You know, Samuel was like, hey, here's this good looking strapping young man. Yeah, that's the king right there. And God was like, no. Nah. And then he continued to go down. Tum, 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 say, oh, yeah, you got any more sons? Uh, yeah, I got this dude out there in the field tending sheep. And God knew King David and he knew his heart. And that's how he ended up getting chosen. You know, even so God right there is just telling you not to judge by appearance. And, and when that creeps when partiality starts creeping into the church, um, then that's no different than the world. Um, and I, I just remember Pastor David saying, you know, as we get into uh, this uh, uh, second verse here, um, it says, uh, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, Hey, sit here in the good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my, let me put my feet up on you. Um, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And I remember Pastor David saying that he didn't look at tithing for a long time. I don't know, it was like seven years or more. Because he knew this. He didn't want to be, it's our human nature. He didn't want to have that partiality to people. Um, and lots of times, you know, you can imagine... Uh, if you were and say this dude was busting out a hundred grand a year tithing, you're like, hey, he's at least making a million bucks. And all of a sudden the church needs something. 
you know, and you're in a desperate situation where you know where are you gonna where you wanna wanna lean. Hey, you wanna go out to uh, you wanna go out to dinner? You know, that would be our as, as as human beings. That would be our way of dealing with it instead of hey, God, you provide, and we see in this place, I mean, God provides, you know, provided this place with twenty thousand dollars in the bank. Um, so if there should come into your assembly. Um, you know, I look at, um, you know, some churches, not this one, but I've heard, you know, they got little special sections, like some of the mega churches, they got little sections for the people that tithe here and may got some celebrities up front so they can get on camera. And, you know, I can tell you that at this church, I look at, we can take Carl for an example. I mean, you know, Carl has nothing but God. And he, so Carl trusts in God for everything that is provided for him. And that's why Jesus talks about the poor and how there's more poor in the world that have accepted the gospel than the rich. And where is, where is Carl? Is Carl at the back? Nope. Carl's at the front, man. There's another, other people. Where are they at? At the back? They're actually at the front. You know, so you know, as, I, as I'm reading through this, I'm kind of like, hey, man, you know, there's churches. You know, doing what? what we're called to do. Um, but he gives us a good illustration, uh, James does, of, uh, of, of people um, in the church that could come into the church uh, that, uh, you know, that we could, that could sway, um, that could sway us. So man with gold rings, uh, this man is shown to be rich. So in Roman society, by rings, that's how you, you know, kind of showed in the same way today. You got Mr. T. You know, if we saw Mr. T on the street, we'd be like, yeah, that dude's got some money because he got $150,000 hanging around his neck, although it could be fake. We don't know. Um, but that's what they did in society. You could even go, the Romans had a place where you can go rent a ring so you could look rich. So you just go rent a ring. Um, <laughs> rent a ring. Uh, there also should come in a poor man. The word uh, signifies one very poor even to be uh, beggarless. Um, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Uh, to favor the rich man over the poor man uh, in the way James described shows a deep carnality among Christians. Uh, their thoughts, their evil thoughts are evident uh, by their partial actions. Um, you know, they're uh, It was said there should be people that are homeless should, sitting beside people with homes. You know, there should be, uh, you know, I know that, um, I just remember one day there was a guy named John. He's with the Lord now. And uh, I was coming around the traffic circle and God said, go to the cafe. So I drive to the cafe and I pull up. He's sitting outside and I was like, ah, I know what I'm here for. Cool. I hop out, this guy's in a wheelchair, face is all burned up, smoking a cigarette with oxygen tank. And I'm like, man. But anyway, we, we brought him in here and uh, rolled him to the altar and explained to him about Jesus and got him a Bible. And one of the people at our church had picked him up at Walmart. He didn't have nowhere to go. He was just hanging out at Walmart. And she brought him here. And then uh, what do we do? We... we, we clothed him, we fed him, and then Jim Rouse, God bless him, actually let him come live with him for a season. And this dude was, it was a challenge. I mean, but, you know, that's an example of, you know, Jim was a deacon at the time, but I mean, you know, Jim did, has done that. I'm not calling out Jim, but I mean, that was, you know, that was just uh, being Jesus-like. And Jesus is our example. You know, Jesus came into the world. He didn't choose uh, to be him in the world as a rich man. I mean, he was a king. You know, but he came to this world as a poor man, born in a uh, manger in, in a barn. Uh, his parents didn't even have two turtle doves when they went to the temple. Um, so, you know, obviously there's, you know, God has a heart for the poor. And, and we're supposed to be just like Jesus. We should have a heart for the poor. And when you walk in this place and look, as we're going through here, I mean, we got a blessing room. So we clothe. We've got... Uh, a food uh, 
table of food right there. We got food boxes, um, but we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, man's partiality rarely agrees with God's heart. So listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Um, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Um, though it is easy for a man to be partially rich, God is to be partial to the rich. God isn't partial to them. In fact, since riches are the obstacle to the kingdom of God, in Matthew 19, 24, um, there is a sense in which God specially blesses uh, the poor of this world. Let's turn to uh, Matthew uh, 19, 24. That's at the front of the Bible. For the pastors in the back. Again, I say to you, and we've all heard this, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They are chosen to be rich in faith because the poor of this world simply have more opportunities to trust in God. Therefore, they may be far more rich in faith than a rich man. The rich man may trust him, but the poor man has to trust him. You know, if we get into a situation and we got money and we, you know, physically we got the ability, we may try to put our ability to solve that situation uh, in what we can do, how much money I can make or the physicalness. And instead of a poor person, you know, has to trust in God, you know. And you can take, again, I take Carl as an example. <coughs> totally dependent on the Lord. I mean, totally, 100%, you know. And, you know, praise God that, you know, we, he's a member of our body here. And, and uh, you know, when you see him in here, everybody is like Carl, you know, but. Um, the rich man may trust him, but the poor man must. The poor man has no fortress but which to hide except the two strong arms of God. Uh, this seems to refer to Matthew eleven fifteen, And the poor had the gospel preached to them. Uh, these believed on the Lord Jesus and found his salvation while the rich despised, neg neglected, and persecuted him. Has God, has not God chosen? Um, the poor are chosen in the sense that the poor uh, more readily respond to God in faith, having few obstacles, fewer obstacles to the kingdom. Uh, the church demonstrates that uh, comparatively more poor people than rich people have accepted the gospel. Uh, when we choose a people by what we can see on the surface, we miss the mind of God. I uh, remember that Judas appeared to be a much better leadership uh, than Peter. Um, he added humanity to his deity, and he came to earth, he came into poverty. Do the rich not oppress you and drag you into courts? James reminded his readers that they often sin, that the rich often sin against them, oppress you and drag you. This is often because the love of money is the root of every kind of evil, which is in Timothy 6.10. Uh, do they not blaspheme? Uh, is the rich here spoken? If the rich here spoken of were Christians, uh, they... And then they may have said to blaspheme Christ's name uh, when uh, by their wicked carriage they caused it to, blasp it to be blasphemed by others. But if rich unbelievers be here meant, the rich men of those times being generally great enemies to Christianity. Um, eight and nine. Uh, partially is condemned by the scriptures. So if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Royal law is God's law. You got uh, our law is man's law, but royal law is divine law. You just take divorce, for example. You know, 
today, and I was going to divorce my wife, and you just go down there and sign the paper. The royal law, God's law says, hey, you know, yes, you can do it under this circumstance, but really you shouldn't do it at all, and you should try to work through that. That's an example of, you know, the royal law versus uh, man's law. Um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you do well, but if you show partiality, uh, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Um, James anticipated that some of his readers might uh, defend their partiality to the rich as simply loving the rich man as their neighbor instead of being obedient to the law. Say, yeah, I love him, my neighbor. He got a nice boat and house. Um, but if you show partiality, you commit sin. The royal law. Our God is a great king, and his law is a royal law. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you, don't, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and do so as those who will be judged by the, liber by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, so we're supposed to... Uh, Show mercy. There's a no one day when we get to heaven, that's what we want to be given to us when we're sitting at the, at the, at the judgment. Um, we can't say, I like God's commandment against murder, so I'll keep that one. But I don't like his command against adultery, so I will disregard it. But God cares about the whole law. Um, and we go to Matthew uh, 22, 36 through 40, and we know what Jesus said um, are the two greatest commandments. Uh, it says, Teacher, which is, the great command, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. The whole law must be kept if one will be justified by the law. So speak to those, um, so speak and, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the liberty of the law. Um, we are under the law of liberty. It has liberty, yet it's still a law that must be obeyed and that will be judged by at the judgment seat of Christ. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. As those who will be judged by the law of liberty, we should always show mercy to others by refraining from partiality. The mercy we show will be extended to us on the day of judgment, and that mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's do 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if one says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? All right, this is getting deep here. I was like, oh, man, I wish I had about a whole... A lot more time to get into this. Um, so what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? So James did not contradict the Apostle Paul, who insisted that we are saved not of works, Ephesians 2.9. James merely clarifies for us the kind of faith that saves we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, but saving faith will have works that accompany it. As a saying goes, faith alone saves, but faith that saves is not alone. It has good works with it. Um, and we all know, you know, Romans 
9, 10, confess with your mouth on the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Boom. All right. So somebody says, hey, I say that. But yet, James is right here. It's given to us going, uh, uh, well, you got to have works. But wait a minute. I thought Paul said uh, it's not by our works. So, so what is it? And some people can, you know, uh, misconstrue what's going on here. So an example of this, um, if a guy comes to this church and he stumbles up to the altar, falls down, you know, we're probably going to think he's drunk. Which, by the way, we have seen drunk people here. Drunk people do come, drunk, uh, people on drugs, but as long as they're not out of hand, we still love them. Most people would say, hey, you know, just, just turn around and go home. Um, but, you know, they're not playing uh, the gospel at the bar. So, you know, I think it's an awesome thing that, you know, Jesus would have done, what would Jesus do? Jesus would say, hey, come in, you know, hear my word. I want to heal you. Uh, but anyway, so this guy falls down. So everybody gets around him and they're trying to figure out, hey, man, you know, what's wrong with this guy? And they, you know, a couple of safety team gets over there and a couple of nurses and they check and they say, oh, this guy's just malnourished. And he needs some food. The guy wakes up and, uh, all the food's around him, and he says, man, we got all, all this stuff around here to make you well. Do you believe? And the guy's like, yeah, I believe. I believe. We go, all right, good. And you got 60 minutes to live. That's what they're saying. So as he comes by, you're like, hey, man, do you believe? Yeah, I believe. Well, well you know, you need to take an action right here to eat this food around you, and you'll get well. But the guy keeps on, I believe. All of a sudden, 58 minutes goes by, and he's not doing well, struggling to breathe. And we're like, hey, man. You know, you got to do something. And then all of a sudden, 59 minutes goes by and 60 minutes goes by, boom, he's out. So he had the faith, but he didn't have the action, so therefore he died. Um, and it, it, he's kind of saying that same thing right here. It's like, hey, you know, when we accept Jesus, you know, there's a fundamental change. And then we go out and we start doing, we don't do works because of doing works, we do it because we love Jesus. Um, and if there's, no, if there's no fundamental transformation in us, you got to ask your question. You know, I, I remember, you know, I came to that point, I said, God, you know, I asked God to forgive me, didn't realize I needed to confess my sins, you know, on Jesus. Uh, and that was the only way uh, to heaven was put my uh, faith in Jesus. Um, but it wasn't until I came here. Um, that I believe I was saved. Now, if you'd ask me, hey, do you believe, you know, which we get here in just a second, um, when, you know, he really starts slamming us. Uh, but, um, you know, I've, I've got a friend of mine, and I question, yeah, that's a tough one. I question because he reads his Bible. I know he tried to bring his friend to the Lord, uh, but he doesn't go to church. He doesn't tithe. He doesn't do, there's no works in his life. But I still believe that he believes, you know. So that, this is a, you know, a little tough thing. Um, but, you know, that's what James is telling us here. Um, so what does it profit? My brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? Um, James is not, con I think I've read that, but James is not contradict Paul, uh, who insisted that we are saved not by works, um, we are saved by the grace through faith, not by works, but saving faith uh, will have works accompanied with it. Um, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk uh, in them. That's Ephesians uh, 2.10. You know, when, when people ask, hey, you know, I accept Jesus, your, your friends and family know who you are. So if you walk around with a cross and you say you accepted Jesus and there's no, they see no change in your life at all, at all, then they're going to be questioning. They will question. If you died, your mom will be going there, oh, I hope he, I, I believe he's in heaven, I hope he is. That's not what I want my mama to be saying about me when I die. I don't want her to go, I know he's with the Lord. You know, that's what we want people to say about us. And that's the example that we want to be uh, to our friends and family. I still got friends that aren't saved, but they're they're they watching me. Hey man, you uh, you, st you still ain't drunk? Nope. 
You know, seven years is still hot. Do you still going to church? Yeah, yeah, I'm still doing good. You know, so I mean, people were watching us. You know, if there was nothing changed, they would say, well, "It's just like everybody else." You know, I've seen or been influenced by. Um, Fifteen. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, "Depart in peace, be warmed and filled," but you do not give them the things which they are needy for, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So you can imagine a person coming up here and saying, Hey, Pastor Tom, uh, and my light, I got my lights turned off, and uh, my family, we don't have any food, and uh, we're cold, and um, things are really tough. And Pastor Tom goes, Praying for you. Yeah. Doesn't even pray for you. Praying for you. The Lord will take care of it for you. All right, have a good day. You send them out the door. You know, that's what he's talking about here. But praise God, we don't do that here. You know, we've got a, a ministry um, that, you know, does pay people. It's like, you know, we're not, you know, hey, I need my light bill paid for. You know, that, that doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, there's some um, discernment that goes on with that uh, when we do that. But you all are a part of that, too. So, you know, everything that goes on in this church ministry-wise, you know, we all get uh, those rewards. Um, because if you're tithing and giving and serving, um, but you know you got the food table over here, we got the blessing room over here. So somebody comes in, they don't have uh, the basic needs, they don't have uh, you know food and clothing. Um, you know we can help them that. And then we've even done the shelter. You just look at Jim Morales taking that man in. Um, I'm sure there's other people in this church that have taken people that have, have been homeless. I know that Alan was homeless uh, when we had the bridge house and there was some other a lot of other guys that were homeless and we took them in when we were had that ministry going i mean we all get to share in that uh one day you know so this is a this is a good place as i look you know as you look through these scriptures and see you know what church is supposed to be like and what what are we doing you know are we discriminating are we showing partiality are we feeding are we clothing what are we doing here at this place and as you look, you're like, yeah, 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 we're, I, I believe, you know, no, we're not perfect, but, you know, we, you look around and see what we do, and, you know, I'm not, you know, everybody gets, oh, I'm proud, but, you know, there's a good pride, and I think, you know, we all should be proud of what, uh, what Pastor David has created, and then how, you know, we've continued that on, and how it's continuing on, and how we're all, we're a big part of it, you know, each and every person in here that, that, that serves or ties or, or uh, you know, goes out and, and spreads the gospel and goes to the nursing home or the hospital. Um, you know, we're doing all those things that a church is, is supposed to be doing. Um, so if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, uh, to fail in that most simple good work towards a brother or sister uh, in need demonstrates that one does not have that living faith. Um, and we can only be saved by the living faith in Jesus. Uh, be warmed and filled. Um, to say this uh, means you know that that person in front of you has got an issue. You know, they, they, need, to be, uh, they need to be clothed and they need food. Um, you, know their need, you know their need well but offer nothing to help them except a few religious words. You know, that's not what we're called to do. Um, when the need arises, we should... Here's a quote that I like. It said, when the need arises, we should sometimes pray less and simply do more to help the person in need. Uh, we can sometimes pray as a substitute for action. Yeah, and, and I'm sure we're all guilty of that. Um, you know, one of the things that... You know, we really need to do, and we make it do a better job at, um, is there's people in this building right now that need uh, a mentor or that need us. And we know who those individuals are. Um, and, you know, we need to reach out to the people here uh, and help them through. And it ain't easy. Ministry ain't easy, you know. Thank God's got me one right now. Praise the Lord. Um, and uh, I was kind of 
uh, leadership back in the day put me with this guy and then it just kind of but now he's back and and uh, so we'll see how I deal with that but I also feel guilty uh, because there is there was another brother and, and he's got some serious issues and was just I mean overwhelmingly blowing my phone up just in just crazy and I just said hey you know I love you but yeah, you can't be texting me like 30 times and, you know, at four in the morning. And then I never heard back from the guy. And I was like, Phew, praise the Lord, I got that situation. I mean, it was crazy. But now as I'm going through this, I'm like, you know, man, you know, that's kind of convicting. Here's somebody that, yeah, it's challenging. But that's what we're, we're called to ch be challenged. We're, we're, you know, ministry is, can get it can't get dirty and can't get ugly, you know. And I, yeah, I feel probably led to reach out to that guy and just jump back in it. And uh, but, you know, that's so those people are there around us, and then you know we need to reach out. And uh, because you know if we're not in their lives, then what are they doing? You know, if that person that's really, you know, that's really really oh man, you know, a lot of hey, some people probably have left this church over people that they're like, I just can't deal with that person. I'm out of here. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not biblical. We're supposed to stick and stay and help them best we can through those issues. I mean, well, that's what Jesus would do, you know. And they can, you know, Jesus, the word is true. I mean, there it is. If we got the faith to believe it, you know. Hey, when we lay hands on somebody, the Bible says they're supposed to be healed. And I still, and that's God's timing, and I believe it, but it does get frustrating, admittedly, when that doesn't happen, when we can see it. You know, somebody, hey, they come in here, uh, Bridge House, you know, and those guys, don't ever try heroin's all I got to tell you, because that's some bad stuff. All right, because, <laughs> I mean, it's, apparently it's pretty hard to get off of that. All right, but, you know, we've had a lot of people with addictions go through that house. Now, as man would see it, we would look at that and go, and we weren't successful, you know? I mean, that's just how man would look at it. Like, we did not succeed in this. But these guys came in here for 90 days, know the Word of God now, know what's right and what's wrong, and they may be gone, but it's still, we know that, you know, when that seed goes in, it's there, and it ain't going nowhere now. I pray that they live through, you know, what's going on in their lives. But if they can make it, or even if they do die, we, we don't know their heart. God knows their heart. Obviously, they're living in sin, but hey, so we all are. But, you know, we sent these guys back out into the world. They got kids. And I remember Connie, uh, you know, she said uh, um, when she passed away, one of the things was she wanted... Uh, that house to be used for little children uh, for like women with kids and, uh, and I heard Pastor David go oh, we're going to do a house for men and I was like oh I ruffled my feathers man because I was like that's not what she wanted you know I would say nothing because I know hey hears from the Lord and as time went on I was like wait a minute you know these guys have kids these guys have families. In a roundabout way, that is what's going on. So it was the same thing. It just, you know, God had a different vision. Um, but so it was. I mean, again, you know, or these guys, if they didn't have families, they're going to have families. And they know what's right and what's wrong now. They didn't before. So, again, you know, it's just, you know, this is a, just an incredible place. Um, So 18 and 19. A living faith cannot be separated from works. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith and I will show you my works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is a God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So man, James is like, mm, all up in your face. Oh, okay, so you believe but you don't have any works? 
So do the they, demons believe. They believe Jesus is Lord. All right, but now they're not putting their faith in Jesus for their salvation. You know, they've already shot all that. But he's saying right here, hey, you got faith. Even the demons believe, you know. So I want to see, you know, your, he, he, again, he's talking about, you know, that fruit of the Spirit. You know, he's wanting to see, you know, I'll show you my, you show me your faith and I'll show you my faith and my works. You know, and he's busting us back out here like Jesus. You know, get behind me, Satan. Um, so we can't see someone's faith, but we can see their works. Now, I can't see somebody's heart, but God can. And that's how we ask, just like I did that example a minute ago, when your mama's sitting there at your funeral and she's going, well, he wore a cross around his neck and he said he believed in God. Mm. Yeah, I, I hope he's in heaven one day. Or, no, nah, man, he went to church. Every, you know, what's going to church is not going to save you. Um, but, obviously, if you're at church, dude, y'all are here on a Tuesday night. That's even more than a Thursday night. So you're here on Sunday and Tuesday and Thursday. Your mama's going to be like, he was at church three, four, four days a week. You know, five days a week, you know. And, yeah, he tithed and he did this and he did that. He's in heaven. You know, he, I know he's in heaven. Um, and your friends will be going, yeah, that dude was legit, man. He, he, he put it out. Um, some might try to say uh, that some have the gift of works and others have the gift of faith. Um, it's fine for you to have uh, your gift of works and that you care for the needy, but that isn't my gift. Um, James will not allow this kind of thinking. Um, real faith, this will be demonstrated uh, by works. Um, you can believe that there is one God you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Uh, the demons, uh, the fallacy of faith without works is demonstrated by the demons, uh, which have a dead faith in God. Uh, the demons believe in the sense that they acknowledge that God exists, um, but uh, this kind of faith does nothing for the demons um, because it isn't real faith. Um, and that is proven by the fact that it doesn't have works along with it. Now, they're doing works for somebody, but it ain't for the Lord. Um, 20 through 24. Abraham as a living example. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Uh, do you see that faith was working together with his words, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, uh, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. That's what I like, the friend of God. Uh, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith. Now the day, obviously we know, I don't believe that's, you know, back in the day they didn't have the Bible to say, you know, look at, sacrifices an altar and that's bad you know so we know that God would not ask us to sacrifice our son today you know we know that but back then Abraham didn't know that so I mean you think about as fathers I don't have a kid all right so I'll take my wife as my example but now that's different you know I've got you know actually your flesh and blood you hear from the Lord and imagine somebody come up and say, hey, I heard from God and God said, hey, you need to sacrifice your kid. You'd be like, what? I don't think so. So if you really dig deep, is that, I mean, you know, what? look at Abraham, you know, and look at what he did and look at, you know, how God blessed him and, and the line, uh, you know, that, you know, humanity came through there. And, uh, you know, but today, I mean, to say that, hey, you know, I want you to take your wife and I want you to go up there and sacrifice her. Whew. Yeah, I, I can't say that I would, to be honest. I mean, it, it's, that's, that's hardcore. How many of you would 
sacrifice your sons. You know, if you think about it. You know, but Abraham did it. Or his, he was going to, he did it. You know, and his, God knew his heart. You know, he, he did it. You know, the angel just stopped him. His God, that's not what God wanted. God was testing him. And God tests us. Not on that scale, obviously, but God's testing us to see, hey, when I test him, what's he going to do? Is he going to go all carnal on me, or is he going to, uh, you know, what's it going to take to get Carson to get him to turn back to where I want him? You know, was it going to take that little nudge or Denny coming up and say, hey, bro, you know, or is it going to take the hammer? And I, don't, I don't want the hammer, you know. And some people take a big hammer. Some people had to get run over by the train. Now, I don't want no part of that, you know. Um, but you also, whatever it takes, if you think about it. Um, but do you want to know, a foolish man, that faith without works is dead? James will now... Use the Old Testament to demonstrate what he has already said about the character of a living faith, showing that faith that is not accompanied by works is dead that cannot save. Uh, when Abraham, our father, was not Abraham, our father, justified by works uh, when he offered uh, Isaac, his son, on the altar. And Abraham was justified by faith long before he offered Isaac, Genesis 15:6. But his obedience in offering Isaac demonstrated that he did really trust God. Um, James properly estimates that Abraham actually did offer Isaac his son on the altar. Even though the angel stopped him from actually killing his son, yet he had offered Isaac his son in his firm resolution and intentions and would have surely completed the act if God had not stopped him. Abraham was so complete in the obedience the he counted Isaac as dead and set him on the altar. Um, faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect. A faith and works uh, cooperated perfectly uh, together in Abraham. If he, never, if he had never believed in God, he would have never done the good work of obedience when asked to offer Isaac, as well as his faith was proven true, was complete, and was made perfect. Uh, by his obedient works. And uh, 25, verse 25 through 26. So likewise, uh, Rahab the harlot was also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Um, so you know, we see Rahab the harlot. Significantly, James used two examples of a living faith. Uh, Abraham the father of the Jew, and Rahab, a Gentile. Uh, James perhaps is subtly rebuking uh, the initial partiality that may have developed on the part of the Jewish Christians against the Gentile believers uh, starting to come into the church. And that's no different than today. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, we've got different denominations. Um, you know, we've got uh, different races. The same thing that went on back in that day you know, still can go on today uh, in the church. Um, was Rahab not the harlot also justified by works? So Rahab demonstrated her trust of God, God of Israel, by hiding the spies and seeking salvation from their God. And we know that in this last Bible study of Joshua uh, 2, 8 through 13. Her faith was shown to be the living faith because it did something. Her belief in the God of Israel would not have saved her if she had not done something uh, with that faith. Uh, the lesson from Abraham is clear. If we believe in God, we will do what he tells us to do. Uh, the lesson from Rahab is also clear. If we believe in God, we will help his people even when it costs us something. Um, and that can be uh, true um, today, you know. Uh, it's going to cost, you know, following Jesus is going to cost us something. Um, but, you know, that's what we're called to do. We're called to love others, love other people and help other people. For as much as the body, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so the faith without works is dead also. As much as you can have a body with no life, 
so you can have a faith with no life. Uh, and faith without works is dead. Uh, faith without works is a dead faith, unable to save. Um, so that was uh, when I got into the middle of it there, when he talked about faith and, and, uh, and works, that was, I was like, man, I wish I had a lot more time to dig into that because that, that, that gets deep when I, you know, because we're told one thing, Paul tells us one thing, and then James is telling us the other thing, but they, they work together. But, you know, you got to see that. And you can say, somebody goes, hey, well, you know, James is telling us to do works, and Paul's saying it's uh, by faith. Um, but, you know, then I, I start thinking about my buddy, you know. Um, but, praise God. Now we know faith without works is dead. <laughs>